Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this second plenary session of uh, the uh, Winter School of the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today, Sami Pielström and Sari Kivisto, both former directors of this institute. And also, I would like to mention the, the original masterminds behind the very idea of a winter school to be held here at the Collegium. So the title given to this session is Ode to Academic Writing. And it is really hard to think of anyone else who would better exemplify this theme than Sami, Professor of uh, Philosophy of Religion here at the University of Helsinki, and Sari Kivisto, Professor of Comparative Literature at Tampere University. For if you look at the respective lists of publications, you may feel rather intimidated as the mere volume, not to mention the wealth of themes discussed in those publications, testifies to a deep commitment to the academic form of life and writing as its primary manifestation. So, <laughs> uh, most recently, Sami and Sari have published a co-authored book titled Sivistyksen puolustus, defense of, and well, it's hard to find an English equivalent for the term sivistus, for that captures, the Finnish word captures learning, education, culture, civilization. And I believe you all share my feeling when I say that it was about time that somebody wrote that defense. So please join me in welcoming Sami and Sari. Thank you, Hanne, for this uh, exaggerated introduction. Um, so. Uh, Thanks for coming. We, we, we're going to have a relatively short session, like 45 minutes, I suppose. So, so let's let's get started. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will start, and then Sari will continue. We're sort of dividing this into half and half, basically. Uh, and and we have some some PowerPoint slides there, uh, uh, to some extent based on an essay we wrote together in 2015, uh, basically on on the significance of, of the monograph as a form of academic publishing. So uh, if anybody has, has read that old essay of ours, then uh, you may already be familiar with what we're going to say. There is also something, uh, a kind of a related chapter in, in, in this book, but it's in Finnish, Sivistuksen puolustus, the book that Hanne mentioned. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, um, it's true, as, as Hanne mentioned, that we've both been here, uh, actually spent quite a lot of time here at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies in the past, but that was several years ago, so we've been out of, out of this institution now for, for years now, so it's, it's kind of interesting to, to be back for this um, talk. Um, I might also mention that, uh, uh, because we're now talking about academic publishing and academic writing, I've, I've also been involved in, in the past, not, not anymore, but, but uh, for several years, I was also involved in this uh, Finnish publication forum ranking system. So, Julkaisu uh, Forum, as as uh, as most of you probably know, uh, the national ranking of of journals and publishers. So, uh, we might also uh, discuss those issues if you're interested. That's uh, not uh, strictly speaking part of our talk, but but uh, if there are any sort of more practical questions relating to, to uh, these sort of uh, practices of academic pu publishing and, 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 and rankings and, and so on, then of course we'll be, we'll be interested in discussing those as well. So, um, so we'll start from the obvious observation that, that uh, writing and publishing are among, among the most important things we do as academics or, or perhaps even the most important things we do. Uh, we have to write, of course we have to write all kinds of things. We, we all write email messages. Uh, many of us write grant applications, obviously. Many of us also write referee reports and, and, and other evaluations. So, so there are obviously all kinds of things we do by writing. And uh, <clears throat> then, then, of course, there is academic publishing, writing uh, essays, articles, uh, and books to be published. And, and that's, of course, uh, what we're going to discuss 
here. Uh, also, it's, uh, it's, it's important to, to emphasize that, uh, that at, at, at the university, uh, all teaching is supposed to be based on, on research. So, so in that sense, also from the point of view of teaching, it's, uh, uh, it's extremely important uh, uh, to, to keep in mind that academic writing and publishing is sort of uh, the, the foundation for, for everything. So, so teaching is, is not like a separate, an entirely separate activity from, from research and publishing, but it's in a way based on, based on that. Um, so um, now, uh, as, as we all know, there are all kinds of, of challenges relating to to academic publishing today, especially when uh, when we think of, of young scholars like like uh, uh, doctoral students, doctoral candidates. You, you have to you have to uh, decide whether you're going to write a PhD thesis in the form of a monograph or as a bunch of of articles. That's I, I guess a basic choice, a choice that most of you probably have already made uh, when, when you have uh, started your PhD project. Uh, but of course, the, the kind of pressures and, and, and challenges, they don't end with, with the completion of a PhD thesis. Uh, academics generally are increasing, of course, encouraged to, to publish their research in, in uh, high-ranked and, and high-impact journals. And, and this, this also has to do with this uh, publication forum ranking system here in Finland. But of course, there are all kinds of rankings uh, available in, in, in other countries and other academic contexts. So, so obviously, it, it may seem that a journal article is, is like the, the, the best kind of publication that, that you could hope uh, to, to, to publish in, uh, in, in the academia today. And, and, and there is no no reason to deny the importance of, of that form of publishing. By the way, I should point out here that, that if, if you look at these uh, journal rankings, uh, especially this uh, publication forum, Julkaisu Forumi, UFO ranking, that is, uh, uh, I think, familiar at least to, to, to the Finns here, I suppose, you should always keep in mind that, uh, <coughs> uh, that if, if anybody uses those, those rankings in order to evaluate an individual scholar's uh, performance in, in publishing, that's always a misuse of those rankings. It, it should never be used in that way. So when you're being evaluated for, for a scholarship, for a job at the academia, uh, those evaluations should not refer to the publication forum rankings. Those rankings are intended to be used uh, by the Ministry of Education and Culture when they allocate funding to universities in Finland. So, so they look at, uh, look at the statistics and they look at uh, enormous masses of publications, like thousands of publications, and, and then those rankings provide a kind of an average quality indicator at that level, at the university level and at the national level, so not at the individual level. And I think that's important to, to point out uh, when we're talking about journal, journal publishing. However, in, in this presentation, we're not focusing on, on journal article publishing, but we're focusing on the monograph, because we feel that there is, uh, perhaps increasingly, there is this need to defend the, the importance, the significance, and the lasting value of the monograph as a form of publishing. But by saying this, uh, we're not, uh, we're, we're not uh, saying that uh, uh, that only monographs would be valuable, or, or that uh, the monograph should, should be valued uh, more than some other forms of publishing. We are uh, in favor of diversity in academic publishing and publishing generally. Uh, we're not against any other form of publishing. We, we just want to sort of remind you all of the importance of still writing and publishing monographs. So, so this, is, this is what we're going to discuss. <clears throat> and that's the basic, uh, basic argument or basic idea of, of this presentation. Uh, we believe, we still believe that we should appreciate the irreducible plurality of academic publishing, uh, realizing that merely producing uh, immense numbers of journal articles 
will not compensate for the lack of, of publishing monographs, for publishing deeply reflective, argumentative, unified, and also comprehensive studies on substantial issues that can, cannot be adequately dealt with in, in a single article length, um, <coughs> more focused uh, <coughs> uh, text. So, uh, so that's the basic, basic point. Um, we might, that's a kind of a proposal how to, how to define a monograph. It's, uh, it's basically an original book length scholarly study of a focused and, and unified theme, topic, issue, problem. It, it has some kind of a chapter structure. It's typically authored by one individual or, or in some cases two or, or more people <coughs> uh, who, who, who share the authorship. They may have special roles there, but, but the authorship is typically shared if there are multiple authors. So of course, it, it's, it's very different from the standard journal article in the natural sciences, for instance, where there could be dozens or even hundreds of authors. And, and, and so, so clearly monographs are books. That's, that, that's, that's sort of the obvious thing to say. Uh, <coughs> they can be electronic books, of course. They don't need to be physically printed. <coughs> but clearly not all books are monographs. So, 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 uh, so a book which collects articles by, by several authors, that's not a monograph in our sense, nor is uh, a textbook uh, intended to be used in the, in the classroom basically. Uh, of course, in some cases, the, the sort of, uh, there could be some sort of uh, uh, hazy border zone between, between these different types of book. Um, <coughs> and and uh, also, it's important to, to, to uh, perhaps emphasize that the monograph is not the same thing as, as, a, uh, as a book uh, intended for a general audience. Uh, like uh, that, that could could have a sort of a really large readership. Of, of course, of course, it's possible that a, that an academic monograph gets lots of readers, but but that's that's uh, perhaps not not very uh, typical or not not the not the usual thing. Uh, let me see. Well, I guess ba I basically <coughs> basically said all this already. <coughs> so so the. The basic idea is, is that in, in, a, in a monograph, uh, the author, the scholar, is, is able to develop a, a substantial argument focusing on a, on a unified theme, uh, not just make sort of one, one major point as, as, as in an article typically, but, uh, <coughs> but, but offer a, a more comprehensive, uh, more detailed discussion surrounding a certain academic or scholarly problem. Uh, <coughs> so it, it can be, uh, I think, argued that the entire argumentative and, and narrative approach uh, of a monograph is, is different from at least a typical journal article. It's not just an article on a larger scale. It, it's a different kind of approaching a scholarly issue. That's, that's, that's also our uh, message here, I suppose. Um, if I spend five more minutes or something like that, and then, then it's it's your turn. A few more slides. Uh, now, <coughs> of course, <coughs> a book, a monograph, or any other book can can be used for for multiple purposes. Uh, <coughs> so, you could also, uh, uh, for instance, make a sort of uh, uh, more popular point in, in societal discussion by publishing an academic monograph. So, so, so we are not uh, willing to, to draw any strict essentialistic, so to speak, bound boundaries between these different forms of, of publishing and, and the different kinds of use or impact they might have in, in, the, in the academic discussion and, and in, in the larger uh, <coughs> societal discussion. Mm. Now, uh, <coughs> I think it's still the case in, in many fields, in the humanities in particular, uh, in the traditional fields of humanities, like maybe history or, or, uh, or philo at least some branches of philosophy, also theology, I think, and, and, and other, other fields, that, that you still, at some point of your career, you should write a real book, like a real academic monograph. 
even if your dissertation is a bunch of articles, that's, that's entirely fine, of course, uh, and, and, and uh, we're not willing to, to make any sort of uh, uh, evaluations or, or co comparisons be between the, the different ways of, of, of writing a dissertation, for instance. It, it's really uh, uh, crucially dependent on, on the topic and, and the tradition in, in, in your specific field. Uh, but at least there still seem to be some, some fields in the humanities where you don't really qualify as, as, as an international scholar uh, of, of high standing unless you've published a real book with, 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 a, with a good internationally recognized academic publisher. At least uh, uh, this still seems to be the case, uh, may, maybe not in all fields. I mean, if, even in philosophy, which is, of course, my own field, uh, there are some uh, subfields branches of philosophy where you, you're not really expected to write monographs anymore. For instance, uh, philosophy of science seems to be turning into that direction and, 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 and you, you can be a really serious uh, international uh, high, high, uh, high, high level scholar, so to speak, uh, with publishing only, uh, only journal articles in, in, in high ranked journals. That, that's entirely possible. But, but uh, it, it still seems it's, it's not the case everywhere. Uh, now, uh, typically uh, monographs are criticized be because they are, uh, they are kind of expensive and they only reach a small audience and that's, uh, <coughs> that's, uh, that's of course true. Uh, publishers have difficulties with uh, uh, with, with monographs in, in, in that sense. Uh, it, it could also be argued that in, in many cases the most original research, uh, at least in the beginning, only reaches a relatively small audience. I think it, it's not a criticism as, as such against any form of publication that it only gets a, a small audience. That, that's, that's almost inevitable if, if you're doing something, something like really serious and, and, and new. And, and, and so, so that's, uh, that's often the case with a serious academic monograph. Not, not very many people will read it, but, but, but that's, uh, that's nothing to be worried about too much. And, and there could always be readers in the, in the future, of course. Uh, now, as everybody knows, academic publishing is, is uh, in, uh, in a kind of a uh, state of transition or, or maybe even, even in, in some sort of crisis, there are these uh, publishers uh, operating, of course, in, uh, uh, in terms of business logic and in, in the commercial <laughs> world, and then there are universities uh, spending taxpayers' money to, to uh, uh, <clears throat> both to produce the content for those publications and, 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 and also to, to buy the books and, and, and journals or, or uh, rights for, for reading the journals through the libraries. You all know that's a, that's a very complicated issue. And then, then there are these new initiatives like here, for instance, in our local context, there is uh, something called uh, Helsinki University Press. You may have heard about that. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a new publisher associated with the Gaudiamus, the Finnish publishing house, and also the University of Helsinki and, and, and the Helsinki University Library. And, and they have this, uh, the, this, this new program of, of publishing open access monographs. Uh, so uh, everybody knows about open access journals, of course, and, and, and articles published there, but, uh, but, but, but now perhaps increasingly in the future it will be possible also to publish open access monographs which, which will make obviously the, the monograph then available to, to a larger audience and, and, and basically to, to everybody interested uh, anywhere in the world. So, so we'll see how that develops and, and, and that, that's, a, that's an interesting new idea. Of course it's not, it's not cheap, I mean so, somebody will have to pay anyway. Maybe we'll we'll move on to, to Saris part of part of this uh, uh, <coughs> this this talk very soon, but uh, <coughs> but also maybe so something needs to be said about this this uh, concept of, of usefulness and also impact. Uh, the monograph typically might might not seem as somehow useful or beneficial for the society or or uh, having having a having an immediate impact on anything. Uh, in the same way in which uh, uh, shorter articles 
might might seem to be useful or, or valuable. Uh, but uh, but this again uh, depends on how exactly we we uh, define or, or or talk about usefulness or impact. We we have to keep in mind the sort of long scale. The the monograph is a traditional form of publishing with a really long term uh, and 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 uh, hopefully perhaps also for that reason lasting impact so so it doesn't aim at anything immediate or or, or anything short term and and, and in, in that sense it's it's it, it still seems to us that it's it's the publishing form uh, in the humanities par excellence which which, uh, which which can be taken to have have an impact in the long run even uh, even rather significantly so so that's that's the last uh, last slide uh, in my part of this talk, we, we have to, when, when we talk about impact in the academia, we, we have to keep in mind this long scale, uh, long, long term, uh, like temporarily long scale, but, but also, uh, but also the, 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 the kinds of unexpected ways in which things can have impact. And, and, and whenever you need to, to somehow tell, for example, the, uh, the, the funding organization when you're applying for a grant, for instance, the, you need to uh, tell them what your what, what the impact of your work is then 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 uh, that that's something that should be kept in mind that it it it, it can be uh, really uh, uh, different in different cases and, and 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 there there is both impact within the academia impa impact within your own field impact on other fields impact beyond the academia and it, it's not a simple thing but I think at, at this point sorry will continue thank you Um, thank you for this kind of in invitation to come back for a moment uh, to the Helsinki Collegium. Um, uh, I gave a talk on, 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 on the praise, oh, in praise of the monograph here three years ago, so I'm just going to briefly continue with that topic uh, here by focusing on... Um, sorry. On... Um, on, on the distation, I will say a couple of words about distation. Uh, if your distation uh, consists of articles, it reaches uh, the relevant academic audience, perhaps um, in many cases more easily <coughs> than a monograph. Um, and uh, journal articles also easily count more in the publication assessment system. You seem to have a longer uh, publication record in, in that sense. Um, uh, but still, if, if you revise your PhD uh, thesis in a full-blown academic monograph, that could be your entry to the, uh, into the international scholarly community um, uh, in your field. Of, of course, it depends on, on the specific subfield and topic um, on which you work, um, and the publishing options are ideal um, in different ways in different fields. Um, uh, but it seems that a big book is still needed, especially in, in many fields of the humanities and social sciences. So um, <clears throat> if you have published a certain number of scholarly papers and articles, you have a longer, as I said, a um, list of publications, but still in some areas, especially in history and uh, in many other fields of the humanities, a big book is still needed as an indication of scholarly maturity. It's also important for senior scholars to, to enter the international, international scholarly community. Um, if you uh, look at the internet, there are many kinds of websites and guides um, that give you advice how to turn your um, dissertation into a more, uh, in turn, more inviting in a way, an accessible <coughs> academic book um, from dissertations to or from dissertation to book websites are abundant and uh, and usually they say that the introduction section for example no longer needs to include any long explanations or justifications for your methodologies um, and very detailed reviews of previous literature um, uh, in the field are, are usually unnecessary so uh, also they say that abundant formal citations of what others have previously said about the topic should often be modified and, and removed. 
um, of course, you have to be critical about this advice also. But if you go to look at, for example, um, top five tips for, for turning your dissertation into a book, they say that first you should write the dissertation as a book to begin with um, so, that, um, so that you wouldn't um, have that very long <coughs> methodology section uh, because it will probably be removed from the, from the book. Um, I'm not very sure about this advice because there are still people who, who appreciate methodologies and, and traditional university presses also find them quite interesting, I think. But usually the literature review will be much shorter and you should somehow um, put extra effort into a catchy, appealing introduction and also the conclusion should be strong. And, and they advise that you should make the book short. So a 500 pages long monograph on the significance of the turtle, this is one in example, as a symbol of 12th century religious iconography in Spain, um, will probably be returned to you with a polite email. Um, also, <coughs> they say that you have to know your your market, this is especially important in the US, but increasingly also in elsewhere, so that you have to put some effort on, on designing your book for a certain audience in mind. Ask yourself uh, what kind of class your book is suited for, and, and um, you have to somehow explain what are the main <laughs> selling points of your book also. And then they also give this advice that don't be boring. Um, uh, that's also a matter of taste, I guess, because I like boring things. And, but, but they say that be pro provocative and be original, whatever that means, um, so that the writing style matters almost as much as the content. Um, as Sami already uh, said, and um, um, the role of the monograph is still important in academic appointments. It seems that the monograph is still of great value in the humanities and social sciences for tenure and career progression. Um, and it remains a major achievement in a scholar's career at least, um, still for a moment, and serves the purposes of academic promotion. Um, and this has also been studied that scholars often mention career promotion to senior academic posts as one of the most important reasons for, for writing monographs. So they can influence the career development. Um, but there are obvious tensions also in, in this kind of writing because um, um, tensions between the needs of fast publishing on the one side and the need to think very carefully without hurry deeply about some difficult problems on the uh, other side. So monographs are, they are slow, they are deep, they are stable, they are also very expensive, which is a major problem also. They are slow to write and they are slow to reach their audiences. Since we were given this very rhetorical title, Ode to an Academic Writing, um, it's appropriate to refer to the virtues of the monograph, which is also a rhetorical topic. Um, the monograph allows the researcher to discuss issues that have long-lasting meaningfulness and that can at least best, um, at best be read um, by several succeeding generations. Um, they relate to the research question to larger historical frames because there is more space for developing complicated theoretical and his, uh, systems and historical comparisons. Um, they allow this kind of wide comparative perspective that any other publication um, forum cannot do. We have talked um, in our previous essay on, on the monograph and in that book also in Sivis Tixenpoulos about the ability of the monograph to address complex contents. Um, this is one of the main advantages of the traditional monographs that they involve a serious 
effort of interpreting, analyzing, and structuring a complex content. Um, because they are simply, because they are uh, based on the results of years of reflection and studying and trying to understand a complicated uh, problem. Um, so they offer insights and they allow us to understand complex phenomena which can only be addressed um, in the form of an extended text. Um, we have also talked about um, depth as a, as a word here of the monograph because monographs require deep thinking. Um, this is an old, an old um, reference to Philo, who, um, an ancient philosopher of Philo, who wrote about the, the depth of uh, knowledge. Uh, he said that scholars sought knowledge as others sought hidden sources of water, but the well was always too deep. The knowledge is compared he here to a deep well. Um, and in his view, truth was like a water source, water source, never superficial, but always deeply buried under the layers of earth and difficult to reach. And as truth was never near the surface, the source was never found with ease, and one had to dig ever more deeply to discover it. Um, so if one of the virtues of the monograph is this kind of deep thinking, um, we have also discussed the changing metaphors of knowledge in our book, and it seems that this kind of uh, uh, metaphor of death has uh, gradually been replaced by other metaphors of breadth and extension um, uh, and have been changing from vertical to more horizontal images and ideals um, with all kinds of uh, needs of boundary crossing and boundary pushing interdisciplinarity and networking when these have, uh, have become more common, have been replacing this individual depth and disciplinary depth also. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk because we, I think that we have taken our time, I'm not going to talk about collaboration, which was one of, of, of the topics of this talk. Um, uh, I will go to the final slide, uh, which is somehow also Rhetorical, it emphasizes the individual viewpoint um, that is important in, in academic writing, but especially in monograph. Uh, because in writing and publishing a monograph, we could say that a scholar is not just reporting the results of, uh, of his research or her research, but um, monograph uh, somehow offers a more profound individual and personal perspective to the world um, the scholar is studying, showing how the world can be viewed from such a perspective that no one else occupies. So this is one of our, in a way, ideas that uh, the monograph somehow cap captures the individual perspective that the only that one particular scholar can have on the world. And that is also important. Um, in the current world, although collaboration and all kinds of uh, collective uh, scholarly practices have become more common and important as well. So thank you, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much for these inspiring words. Now there is some time for questions from you. So please, who wants to go first?
you can have a poor theoretical with an illustration or, or empirical article with a very thin theoretical framework. And that, I think that's also one kind of a problem, because it, it would take time to develop that into a monograph, and, and often that is not the purpose, but it's no place where you can publish that as an article, of course. So that, I, I see it as one of the problems that needs to be taken into account when, when planning the, the publication out. Mm -hmm. And it would be useful if there is a list for <coughs> the UFO where mm -hmm. the, all the publications are, are, are listed that can have the word limit there as well, because mm -hmm. it's quite uh, hard work to find out always in which case. Mm -hmm. You want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, I think that, that's, a <coughs> that's a very important observation. I, I completely agree that there is, in a way, a gap between those forms of publishing. Some publishers nowadays have these series of, of brief monographs, don't they? At least, I mean, I have some experience with Palgrave Macmillan, and, and also one of our joint books uh, came out from, from that publisher. It's a longer, longer monograph, but, but, but they, they also have this series where they publish like very short monographs, like up to 50,000 words. So you could, you could submit a monograph that is like, well, uh, basically 100, 100 pages maybe, and, and, and it, it's a sort of a really thin book. So, so that would be some, uh, something in between a long article and, and, a, and a short book, I suppose. Mm. Any other comments on this? No, thanks, thanks for the comment. It's true that there is usually very the word limit of a, in a journal can be, for example, 6,000 words, and that's, that's rather short piece of scholarly. And I don't know how, what's the, uh, at Tampere, it's uh, usually for a dissertation, it's required that you, you include there from three to five articles in, in your dissertation. I, I'm not sure what's the advice here in Helsinki, but, but it dip also depends on the field. Um, how thick your book should be in that sense. But um, mm. what about the Helsinki University Press, which is now you know, focusing on open access publications? Do they have the, this kind of short and monograph version <coughs> possible, or is it? That, that's a good, good question. Uh, I'm not quite sure <laughs> about that, if, if there is a strict limit to, to, to uh, <coughs> sort of uh, the minimum <coughs> limit for a monograph mm. there. That, that's but it's my impression that they want to encourage especially young PhDs mm -hmm. to publish their dissertations mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, may, maybe not the dissertations as such, but books, but the books, books, books based developed on out of dissertations. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. But but in, in general, I suppose, <laughs> online publishing and open access publications, they they perhaps uh, enable these sort of uh, also, also these middle category kinds of uh, things like texts of, of, of different kinds of length. Mm. And they also allow you to use for, um, different kinds of poetics in your writing. Of course, electronic books. I, in, in that longer talk, I had some slides about electronic publication and what kinds of possibilities that offers for you to use all kinds of linked material and images, of course, and, and, and other things like that. So it's. It's an entirely different kind of writing process and also a different kind of experience for, for the reader who can choose between different paths in a way in that book. And, and that's something to be considered in the future. And, and some, of course, some PhDs, at least abroad, they publish their uh, dissertations as electronic versions only, and they can, can be different in a uh, way, in different versions also published of the PhD so that the audience can comment on, on, on those different versions and in a way give advice to the writer how, how to proceed, what's the best way to go on. And, and, and they also may publish um, uh, their mistakes in a way. This, this, I mean, thoughts that didn't turn out to be so successful and that's also possible, but that, that's a, of course an exception to the general. <laughs> so I think we still have time for one more question. Is there, are there any questions? Please. Um, 
I suppose you can, but you have to formulate it as a new project as well. You, I, in, a, in a way, like a postdoc project that you are now working on and adding something to your previous dissertation, mm -hmm. or what do you think? Yeah, I think that's also a very good question, given that <coughs> most of you are now in the process of, of writing your PhDs, and then, then you're, of course, you have to look into the uh, longer term future and, and plan what to do after that. And then, uh, then I suppose many of you will be applying for some, some postdoc funding uh, after, the, uh, after the doctoral degree. And, and, and then I think it's exactly as, as Sari said, that, that you have to somehow have a new project in order to, to, to get uh, funding for that. I, I think it, it could include writing a, a, a book on, on the basis of, uh, of, for instance, articles that were part of your dissertation. But, but somehow, if you, if you just phrase it in those terms that now you're going to, to, to publish the same, you know, in, in, in a way, the same thing in, in a new <coughs> form, then I guess there is the risk that then the potential uh, funding uh, organization will not be as interested as, as, as they might be if, if you if you had a had a new project so of course it, it depends on what exactly you mean by new you could you could somehow develop those those ideas into into some sort of a new shape when you when you write a monograph on, on the basis of, of, of the work that you did in the past but uh, yeah I guess that's uh, that's something that, that many of you will will have to think about and, and so well, you might then submit an application to the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies and look and see what happens. Or, or to the Academy of Finland, of course, as you know, at the Academy of Finland, we have, we have uh, also these postdoctoral uh, grants uh, for three years. It, it's, a, it's a tough competition, but, but definitely you should, you should try after you get your PhD. And there are many foundations, for example, the Konesa, the Konesa, Kone Foundation, who specifically focus on, on postdocs. And, and they don't give so easily fu funding for writing your dissertation, but then after that, it's your chances to get funding from that foundation become uh, easier. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time, so let us thank Sami and Sari once more. <laughs>